innovation, workforce, skilling, etc., which is the theme that we are going to talk about today. On the innovation front, as it was mentioned by Ms. Trump yesterday, today we have India's largest technology incubator in Hyderabad called the T-Hub, which has been doing exceedingly well. And come this time next year, by this time next year, we will be having the world's largest technology incubator slash startup engine in our own city of Hyderabad right here. In fact, innovation has been a huge driver in the growth story of Telangana in the last three and a half years. Our Honorable Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi, for the first time in Indian history, for the first time in the history of this country, talks about startup India. He realizes the importance of innovation. He realizes the importance of skills. He talks about startup India. He talks about skill India. And he also talks about how to ensure that this large demographic dividend, which is up for the grabs for India, because more than 50% of our population is less than the age of 27. More than two thirds of India today is less than the age of 35. So that goes to tell you, India has the largest think force. I don't like to call it workforce. India today has the largest think force on the planet for any country in the history of the planet. As the world is aging, India is getting younger. As the world today, the, the average age you know, goes high and high, India is getting younger and younger. But that throws up a very interesting challenge. All the way from Hyderabad and Telangana government and right up to the United States and Trump administration. The one big challenge every government faces today is employment, is creation of jobs. Now that throws up an interesting question. How do we ensure that this so-called demographic dividend is completely harnessed, is completely leveraged by the governments? The human capital, how do we harness it? How do we ensure that this innovation, in this innovation and knowledge economy, how do we keep going? And how do we make sure, most importantly, women, for whom another added dimension, another compounded problem is the gender discrimination that is rampant across the first world, second world, the third world, irrespective of which country you come from. So we want to talk about all these innovation, skills, how do we ensure we create jobs, how do we also ensure at the same time we create both job creators, a platform for job creators like T-Hub, and how do we also ensure that for those people who are seeking employment, how do we make sure that they're adequately skilled? How do we also ensure that they keep refreshing their skills every so often? So like I said, I have cracker of a panel. And let me start by introducing the four powerful men. I have four, four powerful women. I've never done this in my life, moderation. So I'm a little nervous as well. So you have to uh, you know, bear with me for, uh, for the next one hour. Let me start with uh, Chanda Kocher, the MD and CEO of India's largest private sector bank, a woman who's won multiple awards. I can go on and on, but she's been consistently ranked among the top 100 most powerful women by Forbes and Fortune, and the winner of Woodrow Wilson Award for citizen, co Corporate Citizenship. Chanda, thank you. I think uh, you're here. Chanda Kocher, ladies and gentlemen, a warm round of applause, please. Next, I'd like to introduce Karen Quintos, the Chief Customer Officer of Dell, the highest ranked, most senior uh, position held by a woman in Dell is currently held by Karen Quintos. Karen works very closely on the board of Dell, the, ex high, the highest and the most senior most position, the executive position with Michael Dell and the entire team. So welcome, Karen. And next, we have a woman who's extremely popular, who's done significant work, who's been a tremendous pillar of support to a former UK Prime Minister, Prime Minister Blair, Sherry Blair of the Sherry Blair Foundation for Women. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome her with a warm round of applause. As I've mentioned, I'm the Minister for IT, Government of Telangana. IT normally stands for Information Technology. For, but for the last one month and more so in the last one week. IT also in Hyderabad means Ivanka Trump. <laughs> the lady herself is here, arguably the most powerful woman in the world. Warm welcome to Miss Ivanka Trump. With a warm round of applause, please. I 
I didn't know what to call her because she dons multiple responsibilities, multiple roles. So I wanted to make sure we capture this moment. We have a banker, we have an advisor to POTUS and many, many other things also. We have a lawyer and then we have a chief marketing and chief customer officer. So welcome ladies and then we can get started. Thank you very much. What a group. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> that, it, is a, it is a bunch of really, really energetic people at 9 a.m. in the morning. Do you guys need more coffee? <laughs> well, this is a great panel. Thank you, ladies, for joining me. Um, let me start off by posing one question, and let me start off with Chanda. Chanda, you've uh, done multiple roles. You've been rated as one of the most powerful women in business by Forbes, by Fortune. You lead India's largest private sector bank. You're among the top 10 most influential businesswomen in the world. Let me ask you, what does it take, really, to ensure that you break through the glass ceiling, you work through whatever it is that is required to make it right to the top in the corporate world? Well, I think it's a combination of many things. It's, it's what you yourself as a woman desire and want to achieve. It's what, uh, you know, the encouragement and support that you get from your family. And it's the entire ecosystem in the organization where you build your career. So let me start with the ecosystem first, because I think, you know, I was very fortunate to be part of an organization that has always been a merit-oriented organization. And that gave all of us the comfort and confidence to say that if, even as women, we put in hard work, we'll be recognized for the work that we put in, we'll be given the next promotion or the next responsibility based on your capability and will not be discriminated against just because you were a woman. Uh, well, beyond that, I think, you know, it's about the woman himself or herself in that sense. Because, you know, I have seen that women are actually sometimes even more capable and more intelligent than the boys that we recruit. I agree. I completely agree. <laughs> but at the same time, we tend to give up when it's the most difficult time in our life stage, which is when we are starting our families. And I think that is the time when women need to decide not to give up. Because if you do not give up at that time, then you are able to continue for long. And I can later talk about what ICIC as an organization has done about really making life comfortable for women at that life stage. But I think that is very important. Uh, and I feel that at that time, you know, it was I who believed that I want to do this because it's my desire. I'm not doing it because someone is forcing me to do it. And I think that conviction takes you through the period. But beyond that, I must say that, you know, your family, your larger family, has to be a part of your growth and progress. And it's not, you know, as, as mundane as saying that they're supportive of what you're doing. I think that's actually putting their contribution in a, very, in a very mundane manner. I think what gives the woman the inspiration is the joy and pride that your family feels in your every step. And that is the biggest driver and motivation for women. Fantastic, fantastic. Let me go to Karen quickly. Karen. Chanda represents the Indian corporate sector. She's an Indian woman who's made it right to the top and she's worked her way through. How different is it in the United States? You've worked prior to Dell at multiple organizations and you've been with Dell for the last 17 years. As I've mentioned, you're the top most ranked women uh, you know, in, in, in uh, Dell right now. How difficult or how easy is it in the United States or the first world for a woman to reach right up to the top and to do what you've been doing? Well, first of all, I, I agree with everything that she said in terms of, of what it takes to, to um, be successful. The, the confidence that you have to have in you and your capabilities and what you can do and what you can enable, I think, has a huge impact. And I couldn't agree more on when you reach those difficult times and you feel like giving up is when you actually have to stay the course because as a, as a mother of three, two of which are daughters, it's unbelievable how much of a role model you can be as a successful woman in helping them and their friends and the larger kind of community and being, being successful. 
You know, candidly, I'm actually quite optimistic about what is happening now in this area. I think we all agree that numbers are not moving as fast as they need to, to be moving. But the amount of support that we are seeing in companies, CEOs, um, the, the White House, various other public and organizations in the support around putting, getting more women into leadership roles and enabling that, I think today is remarkable. So um, it's still tough. I mean, there's still a, a um, you know, environment out there that is really conducive to um, men, candidly. And I think through policy change, through culture change, through having great leaders step up and really want to change the game when it comes to this, I'm actually optimistic that over the next couple of years, we're going to continue to see some real moment momentum. Great, great. Let me go to Sherry. Um, Sherry, for those of you who are uh, unaware, mine is the famous surname. She was a lawyer back in 1976. She started her own law firm. And for the first time in the history of Britain, she was the first wife of a prime minister who had her own career. I think that was the first time that has ever happened in British history. So Sherry, how difficult was it to be in the limelight and also to have your own career? And I'm sure there must have been a fallout. There must have been a few issues that emanate from it. So let's talk about it. Uh, and how difficult is it, again, to be in the spotlight again and to fight it out through your own career? Well, I think that, uh, first of all, one of the reasons I was the first spouse of a, of a prime minister to actually have gone to university, and that includes Dennis Thatcher, who didn't go to university, by the way, um, is just a generational thing. Um, my predecessors, if you like, were of a different generation where girls ed you know, didn't get educated. In, in, in fact, um, Dorothy Macmillan, the wife of Macmillan, the prime minister, actually so told her daughter that she shouldn't go to uh, university and stopped her going to university because she said all she needed to do was to know how to run a household. So there's a, there's a generational thing and a change in what, what we expect from women. Uh, what was it like uh, holding down a full-time job as well as uh, being married to the prime minister? Well, I didn't think after 20 to 25 years in my own career where I'd worked when I had three children under five, when I was uh, essentially supporting my husband as he went on his political career, why would I change my job just because he had changed his? Now this did cause... Absolutely. This did cause some consternation in, in, in Downing Street because they basically expected me to be there to be the, the, the hostess and the support and to be wheeled out on the, the uh, occasions when it was required. And I did all that, by the way. But one of the things that enabled me to carry on with my career actually was IT. Because, because by the time I got to um, Downing Street, I was able to conduct my business through from Downing Street. So I might be dealing with my legal papers, I might be answering clients' queries from my desk. My client would not know where I was, nor would they know that possibly half an hour before that I'd been down greeting the First Lady of Tanzania to have tea with her. Uh, now, I couldn't do that uh, without IT, and that made a huge difference to me. And it's why when I left Downing Street and I was thinking, if IT makes such a difference to a fortunate woman like me, surely there must be opportunities for using IT to bring uh, advantages to women entrepreneurs across the world. And that's one of the missions of, of, of my foundation, which is to help women with what we see as the three C's that they need um, for growing their own business. And the three are, we've mentioned one already, confidence because too many women are told what they can't do, not what they can do. Uh, the second C is cap capability, capacity, it's training. It's, it's women, again, don't get the same access to education across the world as, as men do. Um, business is partly instinctive, but partly it's about knowing how to run things right, how to read a spreadsheet, how to build a business plan, how to make the right sort of pitch to get the sort of money that Chandra will then let loan you uh, the whatever capital that you need. And the third one is access to capital. 
and capital is a big issue for women entrepreneurs, and I know there must be many of them in this room that know only too well that when it comes to getting the money to grow and expand your businesses, it's very hard to move the needle, to get beyond the skeptical, often male officers in the banks who don't actually really believe that a woman um, can succeed in business. And so we work with our women to build those things, and we do that by using technology. And finally, I'd say this, you know, if we're gonna do anything in this world, we've gotta do something about men. All right. Yeah, uh, that, 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 that includes you. Men need to, un <laughs> men need to understand that women are their equals. Men need to understand that, that women do face obstacles that they don't understand. And men need to understand that they need to do their share as well. I was uh, recently at the American Embassy in Delhi where we, we'd done a program with the American Embassy called We Can. And I know two of our women entrepreneurs who won that competition are in the room here. But we had a group of 25 Indian women entrepreneurs who came to present their business ideas. <clears throat> at the same time, the American Embassy had invited along some IT entrepreneurs that they had been working with, mainly men. <clears throat> and the women were talking about their obstacles and yet one of the young men stood up in the audience and says, I don't understand what the, the, this woman is talking about. He says, sometimes when I go to, to um, an interview or to, 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 to seek a business, people ask me about whether I'm married and you know, I don't find that offensive. So why are these women complaining that they can't get uh, any help and assistance because when they come there, all everyone is asking them about is whether they're married. And that just showed the women were, were very firm with him about there is a difference because for a man here, if they, you say you're married, people will think, oh, responsible, not likely, you know, got responsibilities, likely to be a good bet. For a woman here who's looking for capital and comes and they say, are you married? And she says, yes, I am. They think, oh, difficult, going to get pregnant, you know, got other responsibilities. So it's a completely different mindset. And unless young men, like the young men in those room, understand that, understand the difficulties that their, their wives and their sisters, and yes, their mothers are experiencing, then we're never going to change uh, this dynamic. Thank you, Sherry. In fact, you talked about... <laughs> Sherry talked about three Cs, capacity, confidence, capital. I think the fourth C today, Sherry Blair. Um, Ivanka, you are advising the leader of the free world. You have a unique opportunity to bring about a huge drastic transformation across the world, especially from the women's perspective that uh, Sherry so eloquently spoke about. In India, in Telangana, we do a bunch of things with the private sector as well. We, do, we work with Cisco in a program called Women Rock IT. We also work with Microsoft, another US company, in what is called as Girls in Technology. We also work with Facebook in what is called as Boost Your Business. We work with ICICI and a bunch of private sector players. My question to you is, how can a government, be it the United States or India or any other province in India or across the world, how can a government ensure that we do more in terms of policies for bringing in more women into workforce, ensuring that they're skilled, and also how can we work with the private sector in ensuring that we give a, a larger share to women? which is what we've been talking about. Well, thank you, and, and thank you for having me here today on this remarkable panel. So much of what was said was deeply inspiring, and, and I agree with wholeheartedly. So one thing I'd just like to throw out there is these aren't women's issues. We're half the population, so we have to just start thinking about them Absolutely. as critical issues, not women's issues. So the role of strong male voices in this conversation, to Sherry's point, is very, very important. Also, going um, back to something else you said, Sherry, I think one of the reasons we're seeing an explosion of women's entrepreneurship is because traditional workplaces often haven't worked for us. We are disproportionately providing unpaid care while also needing to support our families financially. In the vast majority of American homes now, all parents work. So women are working, supporting their families, and providing unpaid care. And often, and you know, after, after years and years, generations, these 
cultural, social, work institutions were not set up with the assumption that there would be two parents in the workforce. So we just have to fundamentally change things. It's starting to happen in the corporate world, albeit typically at larger companies, not smaller companies. It's a lot harder in terms of flexibility, traditionally for people in tech and in finance, making more money, um, not for women working. Um, at the lower income end of the spectrum. So I think that's where government policy comes in. And we need to start thinking about ways to support the modern workforce and the modern reality of dual income households. I think technology is a great driver of entrepreneurship because a lot of women are leaving and saying, this doesn't work for me. And it's emboldening them to go out on their own. Uh, technology is reducing barriers to starting new businesses. It's creating flexibility around schedule. So you were, can work just as many hours or more, but maybe you work some of them after you've put your child to sleep from your living room or from your kitchen table. So I think technology offer, offers tremendous opportunities to women and women entrepreneurs, and we're seeing that in terms of the explosive global growth and domestic growth we're experiencing in, in the United States. But, but going back to, to public policy, um, I think it's incredibly important. We have policies that support the modern working family. You see in tax reform the expansion, the vast expansion of the child tax credit, recognizing the massive investment parents make into their families at a time when wages have stagnated for so long. Um, and working parents really need relief. Um, the child and dependent care tax credit, tackling the cost of child care and the fact that it's not only inaccessible in large portions of the country, um, particularly in rural America, but the cost is enormous to, to many American parents and they're unable to afford to provide high quality child care. So that's another issue we're addressing. So you, you see some of that agenda coming to life through um, components of tax reform. And coming into the new year, um, you will hopefully see it in a national paid family leave program that we're working hard to build coalitions of support for. The president included it for the first time ever in his budget this year, um, paid family leave, maternity, paternity adoption. And, um, and I'm very, uh, encouraged by that step and we'll be working with Congress to try and pass what is a long overdue policy. So, so that's where you have public policy and many other things we're doing. Um, this is a panel focused on skills training and workforce development and we're really seeking to fuel that and make sure that we have the best trained next generation K through 12 rethinking what we're teaching and the alignment of what's being taught in the classroom with the jobs available in the economies into which the students are graduating, but also worker retraining and skills training for older workers whose jobs have been displaced or are looking for, for new opportunities in, in their own lives as well. So this is an area we've been very focused on and I can talk about in more detail if the conversation takes us there. But you'd mentioned the private sector and, and I can't say how important this is. I mean, it's really, all innovation comes from the private sector. That's where it starts, that's where it originates. And government, and thank you to, to all of you out there and you incredible entrepreneurs who are taking some of the world's greatest challenges and obstacles, whether it's humanitarian aids or just providing a service better or reinventing um, or inventing a new idea. So it's, it's incredibly exciting what you're doing, but government's role is to help fuel that, to eliminate barriers, to create an environment in which you can really accomplish your, your dreams and your goals, and, uh, and we're seeking to do that domestically, and, and very excited about the work we're doing internationally to create opportunities for, for entrepreneurs and women entrepreneurs, especially in the developing world. Fabulous. In fact, uh, <clears throat> let me compliment the Trump administration on, uh, as you said, as you put it, long overdue, uh, you know, policy reforms which are in the offing now, and I do hope Congress passes it, and I do hope uh, the Trump administration actually has a huge, uh, huge victory, especially in this very, very important sector. Um, Chandra, okay, uh, you have a very ambitious ICICI digital village outreach program. You've already uh, targeted 11,000 villages across 17 states, and out of which you've already created 7,500 women entrepreneurs. So what, what goes into ensuring that these women entrepreneurs in these villages from the rural settings, how are they empowered? How do you ensure that? I'm sure there must be obstacles in trying to bring them into the workforce. I'm sure there must be a lot of challenges. How, 
how do you overcome that and how do you also ensure that they stay on top of their game and how do you how do they keep uh, sustaining what they do uh, so let me take this in two parts let me also tell you what we do at ICICI to just encourage women participation in a large organization and then let me tell you as as our CSR what do we do in the villages to encourage women uh, you know in the rural areas so in the organization as I mentioned we are an absolutely merit oriented organization and in fact if people ask me do you have special policies for women we actually do not have real special policies for women and I think the only special thing that we do is to create that environment where women feel confident that it's on the basis of their merit that they will rise fantastic, fantastic. Having said that, we also realize that, you know, at specific life stages, women need that special care so that they don't give up. And I'll just point out to a couple of policies that we've started. So we've started something called I Work at Home, where we allow women, you know, especially the young mothers, or even women who have to take care of their elderly parents or parents-in-law, to work from home for extended period and this is not just about sitting and doing some data entry in some corner, but we create a work environment where through the use of technology, we have their computers linked online with our back-end systems. We have you know, face recognition so that we know that it's only the woman who's working. We have face recognition to say that if there's too much crowd around the woman and children are moving around, then the computer will shut off. So in a way, we create a real working environment we are over long periods people can work from home and they do not lose out on their career progression if they're working from home fantastic fabulous uh, the other thing that we've started lately is actually to say that any mother who's got a child up to three years of age we and if that mother travels overnight for office work we of course pay for the mother because she's going for office work but we also pay for the travel of the child and the travel of a caretaker so that the mother can take the child and take it away. Fabulous. Fabulous. Chandra. So these are, these are some of the things in an, in an organizes, uh, organizational environment. But coming to our skill training initiative, you know, we've started a whole skill training initiative across India. Uh, and through that, what we've done is we train those underprivileged youth who are not able to afford higher education. For that, we pick skills which are actually relevant for this kind of youth. So we have about 24 training centers in urban and semi-urban areas in the country, plus around 500 villages where we have taken this skill training initiative. The training skills that we've picked vary from something like a tractor assembly and a tractor repair to electricals to dress designing, garmenting, web designing, and office administration and selling skills. And what we have seen is that as we take these training skills, especially to the rural areas, we have more and more young women joining these training skills. So I'm very proud to say that we train about 100,000 youth every year, and of that, 55% are women. Fantastic. A big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. More than 55%. That's amazing. That's amazing. And, and, and this is what we were talking about before with, with really so much of the leadership happening in the private sector and government taking these great programs and fueling them and, and really bringing them to scale. So, you know, some of the most ex successful examples of skills training we've seen when we've looked across the globe at various apprenticeship opportunities are when government teams up with industry or government teams up with technical schools, community colleges, creates curriculum, and then that curriculum is taught to students, and then on the other side, they, they get a job from a, of a private sector employer. So really creating that ecosystem and making sure there's an alignment with the classroom skills and a curriculum that will actually lead to a good paying job. And a lot of it's outside of the traditional four year college track. I think in America, we've gotten so focused on the importance of university that 
we've really done a disservice to a lot of people who could have had great paying jobs, who could have gone a different route, who could have learned skills um, and maybe had skills better suited to um, to the work that they wanted to do um, and would have benefited from, from technical education or apprenticeship and real on-the-job training. So I think there's a tremendous opportunity in what you're describing and 100,000 people a year. That's amazing. So. That's Thank exactly you. what and, my point was. And since you asked how do they stay mm -hmm. into it, Absolutely. You know, so what we do is we create courses where the content is such that it ensures them a livelihood. Uh, what we've done in the digital villages is that we've actually digitized a whole set of financial payment systems so that it becomes inclusive for people to actually carry on their financial transactions and not suffer for the lack of having a bank account and so on and so forth. Then we provide, after providing them skills, we provide them credit linkage so that these people are able to get you know an ability access to credit so that they can start a livelihood of their own and we provide them market linkages so we link them either if somebody's uh, learned garment uh, manufacturing then we link them to the garment factories around the village so that they get a you know constant source of business or if somebody's learned office administration we link them to the company so that they get a job and therefore, this 55% women who are part of this uh, you know, uh, initiative, almost 95% today are standing on their feet and earning some livelihood or the other of their own. Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, just a great and, story. Yeah, and just what we've seen story. is that this gives them not just an economic confidence, but mm -hmm. it actually gives them a confidence of investing back into their families, into their villages, because I again believe in this phenomena that you know you say that if you educate a man, you educate an individual. But if you educate a woman, you family. educate a generation. Absolute generation. Well, 55% plus um, uh, employment in the rural economy. Let me go back to you, Karen. In Dell, you, you're leading a couple of very interesting inclusiveness and diversity initiatives. One which is called is Women in Search of Excellence, WISE acronym, and then you also have another very interesting program, Men Advocating Real Change, or MARC. You want to talk about it a bit more? Sure. I mean, this is an area that is clearly near and dear to, to, to uh, us, and I'm sure is um, important to everyone in, in the audience. You know, you ask the question, what are, what are companies need to do to get more women into leadership roles and, and help with skills? We launched a couple of years ago unconscious so social bias training. The biases that exist in society today, you, Cherie talked about some of them when it comes to women and you know, ma being married and those types of things. They have to be addressed. Men need to be part of those conversations and that's what we did with the MARC, Men Advocating for Real Change training that we have done. We have trained nearly 90% of our executives. We made a goal that we're gonna take it out to all frontline managers by the end of next year. It teaches all of us that we have biases and it's how you respond to those. And it's what you do to lead your teams through those and recognize that the world is a better place. Business outcomes are great when you have diverse thinking that you can enable. And corporations are just better places when individuals can come in and feel that they can be themselves and really contribute to, to the, the, the company and the organization. We also have a very, very robust employee resource group. Our, our Women in, in Action resource group is the largest resource group that we have. It is 13,000 employees strong. We have 40 chapters around the world. We are using that employee resource group to fundamentally help drive some of the policy changes around paid time, time off, around enabling our flexible work from home solutions. We have, we, we clearly see that technology can enable how women and men can work from home. We have sites across Dell where nearly 50% of the workforce works from home one or two days out of, the, out of the week. And this has actually been a huge enabler for us to hire women back into the workforce that have taken some time off that have children, that their children are getting older and they want to come back. And there is an untapped potential labor pool that is out there 
of women that have master's degrees, that have started their own businesses, that we are actually rehiring back at Dell. And they're um, continuing to lead you know, major, major organizations and, and functions for us. And a lot of that is enabled through a lot of these, these practices. No wonder you won the Working Mother of the Year, 2012, the award by the mother, Working Mother magazine, because the work-life balance, I think, you talked about. So Sherry, going back to you, um, when you launched your foundation in 2008, you talked about how women being a part of the workforce is going to lead to stronger economies. You want to elaborate a little bit on that and, how, and what your foundation has done to further the cause in the last nine years? Well, I think it, it, the, the frustration I feel after, as you say, we founded the um, foundation in 2008, is that you know, all the research we see all the time shows that by empowering women, by women um, getting engaged in the economy, that makes sort of stronger economies. McKinsey recently produced a report which said that the world GDP would increase by $28 trillion if women were given equal uh, access to economic opportunities that, that men have. And yet this year, the World Economics Forum Global Gender Gap showed that when it comes to women's uh, equal access to economic opportunities, we've actually gone backwards. So the, the dial hasn't gone forward, it's actually gone backwards. So what, 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 what is going on? There are clearly, it's not enough to keep producing evidence that empowering women makes a difference. We've actually got to make sure that people do something to implement these things because there are barriers. Take here, here we are in India, um, amazing uh, country, vibrant, so much going on, and yet India has one of the lowest participations in the workforce of women in the world. Absolutely. It is right down there with the, some of the poorest countries in the world and does worse, for example, than countries like Bangladesh. Um, so only, I think it's 27% of women over the age of 15 participate in the workforce in India. And when you look at women graduates from India, 67% of those do not go on after graduation to participate in the economy. So that is a, a huge disadvantage for India. And if, if these women were being contributing their talents to the economy, then the Indian economy would be doing even better. So why, you know, why is that, that happening? And we, we, we've touched on some of those things. And what we have tried to do with our programs is to help women get the skills, to get the information that enables them to, to break down some of these barriers. Um, we talked a little bit, uh, you mentioned, Karen, about the women returners. You know, when we talk globally about women entering into the economy, we then often segue into girls' education, which is so important. But in a world where so many women get married very young, if we ignore the women, as, as you were saying, who after they've had their families, uh, you know, and if you get married at 15 or even 18 and you have your children very young, you are still very active and got a lot to give in your 40s when you're a, possibly even a grandmother. And yet it's very much more difficult for women at that level to repenetrate the job market. And one of the ways you can, you can reach these women is to bring them skill training, to give them access technology, so you reach out to them where they are, whether it's as in Chandra's program in the, the villages, and we, we did a, a great program with Mandeshi Bank in Pune uh, recently where we, they were already giving microfinance loans to, to women in the rural areas, and we added to those loans a component of business training. And as a result of that, um, we found that the women not only uh, got the money, but they used the money more wisely and therefore uh, were able to increase their business skills. So I just wanted to tell you the story about one of the women that, that I met there who'd been on our, our training course. And, and she was 37, she already had two teenage children, six years, ago she had she was working in her shop and she cut off her left hand on a on a, on a, on a slicing machine um, obviously this was a huge uh, problem for her but she picked herself up she came on the, the course got a loan
and um, as a result of, of the business training, realized that she needed to diversify her business. As a result of that, um, it ended up increasing her income fourfold, which enabled her to pay for her daughter, who she wants to become a doctor, to stay on at school uh, beyond the age of 15, which was the age that she herself got married. But I asked her to describe her day for me, and I just wanted to share this with you. So she gets up at five o'clock in the morning, and she then, from five to eight, milks the 10 cows that she now has to produce milk to go to her store. She goes back at eight o'clock, and she then feeds her family and gets her children off to school. At 10 o'clock, she goes to her shop. And by the way, remember, she's only got one hand. And she works in her shop between 10 o'clock and five o'clock. At five o'clock, she goes back and milks the cows again until eight o'clock. And then at eight o'clock, she goes home and she feeds the family again and prepares uh, for the next day and she goes to bed again then at 11 o'clock at night in order to get up again at 5 o'clock in the morning. That's a woman who is absolutely uh, devoting herself to getting the best out of herself and her family and she's the sort of woman that by supporting uh, and the fact that she's done so well has increased her prestige in her village as well. So you know, these are the sort of programs. Now, the other sort of thing we do is for a different level of woman entrepreneur, and we have what we call our blended learning training programs. These are like three-month mini MBA courses. And the point about the blended learning programs is though the women come together to do the business training, most of the course is delivered over the internet so that they actually don't have to leave their businesses. Because if you're a woman entrepreneur and you started a business and you're um, progressing that business, uh, but you need the business skills to expand that business, it's sometimes very hard just to walk away and leave that business. But by using technology, uh, we can provide training to women where they are so that they can carry on their businesses and still get the skills that they need to develop. So, a program we have in Nigeria, for example, it's called The Road to Growth. Uh, one of the women on that program who did our course, for example, was a psychiatrist trained in the UK. She came back to Lagos to start a mental health clinic. And she said, you know, I'm obviously an intelligent woman, uh, but no one had ever taught me about business skills. So I start this business, I didn't know how to do the medicine. But you know, then it's a question of what, how do I manage my finances? How do I manage my staff? How, how do I present a, a business plan? And so the blended learning training gives women the skills, but doesn't require them to have to go away for weeks and months on end in order to be able to do that. So we have to find practical solutions to help women who are earning money now do better at what they do without requiring them to have to make the sort of sacrifices that they can't actually make by giving up their businesses altogether. Absolutely, practical hey, can solutions. I, can I just yeah, add please, one thing to, to, to Cherie? Because it's actually an example that you, you all can see here at, at GES, and it speaks to how do we help connect women, and in particular women entrepreneurs, up to the skills, the training, and everything that, that they need. One of the things that we discovered years ago as part of the work that we've done around women entrepreneurs is access to capital, access to mentors, access to skills, access to expertise that exists out there. And through technology, we built this platform, and you can see it in, um, in the Dell booth called Alice. So think Angie's List for women entrepreneurs. It's built on a technology platform. It uses big data, artificial intelligence to hook women up with other women and the needs that they have around, I need capital access. I need to understand you know, legal um, capabilities. I, I, I want marketing skills that will help me figure out how to market my, my company. And through this platform, we have thousands of women that are interacting with other women that they can connect real time with and through technology and big data, it can, this, this platform continues to be smarter and smarter and smarter. And, and our goal is to enable millions of women that um, can get the access to the skills, the training, and everything that Cherie and, and her foundation are, are helping to enable. So I think technology can, can really, really help there. Technology, practical solutions, sacrifices, and the wonderful the work that your foundation is doing. My compliments. Uh, let me turn back to Ivanka. Ivanka. McKinsey Global uh, uh, Institute study shows 
that if we are able to close this uh, workforce gap um, by 12, you know, 12 percent, we would actually be increasing the world's GDP by 25 percent by 2025. And um, it also, another interesting fact that uh, this throws up, women in top leadership positions and boards actually enjoy greater financial returns. So is, it w was that a conscious choice to um, run your entire enterprise, Ivanka Trump, with all women leadership and completely uh, run by women? Was that, was that for the bottom line? Was that to make sure that uh, you have more women in the right positions? Or how do you go about doing this? Well, I think today, empirically, we know that having equal representation, gender representation, having diversity is a positive. It's financially beneficial to business. And that's what's pushing corporations, um, not just a social responsibility, but a fiscal responsibility to their shareholders. And that's what's pushing businesses to diversify at a faster rate than if they were doing it for some other motivation. So that's exciting. And we're seeing all the studies, we're seeing all the data um, to, to support that very fact. So I, I think the, I think the key, and you know, we've covered so much ground here. We've talked about the importance of public policy supporting working families, women and men, um, who work inside or, or outside of the home. We've talked about the role of technology and how that can connect people to mentoring opportunities, like the great work being done at Dell. We're doing that domestically at the government through programs such as SCORE, which have been very, very successful in getting private sector and getting successful men and women to coach and to mentor other young people who, or not so young people, who want to become CEOs as well. So taking programs like SCORE. We've talked about inadequate access to capital, which happens domestically, unfortunately as well, when you look at our participation um, or our share of venture capital funding is minuscule, 3% last year. Um, we're trying to fix that by A, raising awareness about this issue, but B, increasing our lending through the Small Business Administration. In 2017, we increased the amount of lending to women-led firms by over $500 million um, year-to-date alone, so, so that's exciting. And then internationally, where the barriers are the same but far greater, oftentimes with um, a cultural or legal overlay that makes it particularly challenging. So one of the initiatives we launched, and, and there's so many great initiatives uh, across government. I'm, I'm leaving this stage and going to the State Department run GIST competition, which maybe some of the entrepreneurs here today will be participating in. You will? Amazing. It's a pitch competition to, to support investment and um, great entrepreneurs around the globe doing very innovative things. Um, but but there's so many different programs. But this summer, we launched something that was very extraordinary. We were founding members with 14 other countries of a World Bank initiative called WeFi. And it seeks to address a number of the things we've mentioned, access to capital, access to networks, access to mentorship, and access to equitable laws um, by pushing governments in developing worlds to, to lower barriers and change the laws that prohibit women from full participation in, in their economies. So WeFi is, is very exciting, and we anticipate being able to leverage in excess of a billion dollars to go to female entrepreneurs in the developing world. So we're hopeful that has a profound effect on the ecosystem of women's entrepreneurship generally, but also for the benefit of women in the workforce as well. Because it was noted here that when you invest in women, they invest back into their families, back into their communities, they say 90 cents on the dollar earned by a woman goes right back into our family and community and back into things like education, into health care, um, into things that will create a positive generational impact. So we're very excited about that initiative and, uh, and all the other ways we, we can fuel the exciting work that's being done in the entrepreneurship ecosystem um, at home and abroad. Congratulations. Can I, can I ask you, because Ivanka, that 90%, 90 cent figure is a very interesting one, but I want to ask you as a man, what do you think the equivalent figure is for a man? 40? 
Well, he was supposed to answer that. I'm the moderator. I'm supposed to be asking you questions. Huh? Anyway, I, th I think it must be around 40. Yeah, no, 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 no. It's 30. 30. 30. <laughs> All right. As always, as always, you know, women are the smarter ones Perhaps anyways. 40. <laughs> but you know what I think? I, I, I was trying to... I was trying yeah. to you but do, you, do you know what I think about that? You see, I think there are plenty of men who also invest 90% of their efforts into their family and into their community. And the, the problem is that there are some men, and, and uh, you know, I, uh, my, my own father was one of these men because he abandoned my mother and my sister and myself and never supported us ever, ever again, um, who'd only put, you know, 1%, if you're lucky, into, in, into their families. And the, the question really is for men is, why is it that we tolerate the idea that these men who go off and um, spend their lives in wine, women, and song, somehow that's acceptable? The men who put 90% of their efforts into their families should be speaking out more loudly and saying, these men that don't do that actually are letting us all down, rather than just shrugging their shoulders and saying, oh, well, you know, women, are, women they do 90%, we do 30 to 40 as men, but that's okay. Because actually, it isn't really okay, is it? It's true, and I, and I think this is something, um, Sherry, that I'm glad you brought up, but I'm actually very optimistic about because I see the landscape changing, and especially when you look at the next generation coming up. I think women don't view themselves as purely providing care for their families. They want to work. Um, in many cases, they need to work to support their families. Men, similarly, are taking a very much more active approach in raising children and participating in the family than in previous generations as well. And we see this happening on different scales, but, but all over the world. And I see this generational shift that is very exciting because when you think about true equality, it starts with having this level playing field and sharing the responsibilities, domestic responsibilities, um, as well as work um, workplace responsibilities much more equitably. So I love the natural shift that we have happening, but I think talking about these issues, and I think men talking about the fact that they're not financial providers alone, that they want to participate, that they want to be um, involved parents and fathers is, is incredibly important as well. Now that you raised a very personal question, let me, let me, let me ask, uh, let me throw a quick question to all of you. Um, um, I've learned that all of you are privileged to have a daughter also, each of you. I have an eight-year-old daughter also. So what would you say is the single most important thing that you would like to see changed? We talked about multiple things. We talked about capacity, we talked about confidence, we talked about mentorship, we talked about collaboration with the private sector, we talked about the rural sector. What is that one single important thing from a government and you know, from, from the societal perspective that you would like to see differently, say, a decade from now? We'll start with you, Ivanka, and then we'll move on to others. We have uh, about five minutes, so let's make this uh, crisp. Well, I think I have a six-year-old daughter, and I'm actually trying to get rid of some of her confidence. <laughs> but I, I think the purity of a young girl and the lack of assumption around what her role is, what she should do, what she shouldn't do, what she should like, what she shouldn't like, the longer we can preserve that, the better. So I'm always inspired by my daughter because she makes me realize how many ingrained biases even I have that I don't realize that I'm accidentally putting on one of my children, my sons or my daughters. So, so you know, I think look at our smallest children and see the world as much like they see it as humanly possible. And, um, and you know, hopefully Arabella um, grows up in, in a world where she's never told she can't do something because of her gender. Certainly, um, she'll never be told that by, by her mother. Fantastic. Um, A big round of applause, please. Ingrained bias. Ingrained bias, which is even within all of us. Tell me about it. I'm a man, so I'm obviously going to have a little bit more of that. Chanda? A quick point on what, what you would like to see differently a decade from now, the single most important thing. Well, uh, you know, as you said, we all have daughters. I, I have a daughter, and I think the proudest thing for me to say is that while today here I'm sitting as a panel member, my daughter's sitting here with, in her own right 
as a woman entrepreneur, Can we as have a delegate stand up here, here, please? Mrs. Ms. Kocher's daughter. daughter. There she is. A big round of applause to the young lady. <laughs> What's the name? What's the uh, name, Chand? Aarti. Aarti. Yeah. <coughs> Many congratulations, Aarti. But what I say is that for me, my biggest inspiration are my children. And, uh, you know, why is my daughter my biggest inspiration? Because I think at her age, I expected my mother to do so many more things for me than what she expects her mother to do because she doesn't find the mother She's around. She's a strong young lady. So, yes, yeah. so, so much around. So I think it is about, you know, this is an entrepreneurship summit, so I would say it is about three E's for women. Education, encouragement, and empowerment. Education, and encouragement, and empowerment. Yeah, Big we, round of applause. If we do that, I think sky is the limit for all women. Fantastic. Sherry? your thoughts on what the single most important thing is that you'd like to see differently a decade from now? Well, I've got a daughter, I've also got three sons, and if you were to ask me, you know, what's the most important thing for, for my daughter, I think the most important thing is actually to marry well. <laughs> and if you... Choose the right partner. Choose the right partner. And therefore, when I talk about what I want to see for my daughter, I actually think more about my sons, because as a mother of three sons and one daughter, I have to actually think, how am I bringing up my sons? And for a long time, my main concern was that one day my boys would come to me and say, Mom, here's my girl that I'm going to marry, and I want to let you know that she's going to stay at home and look after me. Um, fortunately, that hasn't happened. My, two old, my youngest is only 17, so if he came and say he wanted to get married, I'd be a bit upset. But my two elder boys are both married. Uh, to very successful career women uh, themselves. But the one thing I said to both of them before they got married, the day before, I said, I know you're very proud of your wife and her career and what she's doing, um, but the crunch time will come is whether you're prepared at some time in your career to take a step back in your career so that her career can flourish. Because if you Fantastic. constantly think, that yes, she can have a career, but it's always secondary to mine, then it's never going to quite work, is it? Because the girl will always then have to take the... the Since you mentioned choosing around. the right partner, one of these days when I'm going to catch the Prime Minister, I'm going to talk to him about his perspective as well <laughs> on choosing the right partner. Um, can you also mention to him when is the time when he's going to take a step back in his career so that I get on with mine? Absolutely. I <laughs> yeah. shall ask him that. I, I, I do think, shall. though, and I just want to layer something on, on top of that because I do think you're right that that conversation needs to be happening about who's going to step back if somebody is going to step back. But I do think we have to do a better job of recognizing that all women are working women, whether they're working inside the home, raising their families, or whether they're working in a professional capacity. And I think we, we have to celebrate that decision either way, but we need to create an environment in which people can make the decisions that are right for their family. So destigmatizing men making the choice to do that, um, but also um, not disincentivizing or not frustrating um, women who choose that as the right path for themselves as well. Well, we are actually out of time, but... I want to say one thing. No, no, absolutely. In okay. fact, you, you, uh, all and I was going to say And what needs to change? Um, I think, I think we, we need to see more women and girls in STEM-related roles, whether they are entrepreneurs that are creating innovative technology, big data, I mean, all of that, or whether it's girls that are graduating with STEM-related degrees. Um, the numbers are really scary, and that is where the jobs are gonna be. I mean, the salaries are gonna be higher, the job security is gonna be greater, technology is, is permeating everything, and what I would love to see is a much more balanced um, set of graduates and women that are in STEM-related fields, because it's going to be a huge business imperative for many, many companies and governments around the world. Well, while we are out of time, I think I have some very powerful women in the world sitting on this podium, so I'm going to take my liberties. I'm going to ask the organizers to give us two more minutes, and then we'll close out some final thoughts, Chanda, on what do you think, again, on skills, training, capacity. We heard about, we covered multiple, multiple issues. Final thoughts, closing remarks on what we should be doing say 60 seconds yeah so i i said that you know education in in terms of uh, uh, in empowerment 
you actually cover everything, whether it's skill, access to credit, and you know, all that. And in terms of encouragement, it's the social approach towards women. But I want to take one minute to talk about India, because this is a forum where I think we should talk about India. And I just want to say that, you know, for India, this is today a matter of both celebration, because India has come a long way, as well as a matter of resolving that there is lots more to do. So, you know, clearly, as, uh, as Sherry said, that, you know, not even 25% of the graduated women really participate in the workforce. And therefore, the same McKinsey study says that for India, actually, we can add in the next eight to 10 years, $700 billion to our own GDP if we actually bridge this gender gap. But the way I look at it is that I think this is a glass half full, because that is what is the potential for India and India's GDP. But while we have a lot to do, I think I just want to tell this forum that I think India still does much better than many, many other countries in the world. And let me take, you know, it's a wide spectrum. I mean, you do not have a country where you have 100 million families impacted by the self-help group movement, of which 85% of that self-help group um, empower, you know, people are women. Out of which 20 million are in Telangana. Yeah, yes, absolutely. So you move from there to the whole entrepreneurship uh, thing. And you know, I think India's economic structure is changing. It's no longer just a manufacturing or a services economy. It's now becoming an entrepreneurship economy, an economy of value chains, which gives women more and more enablement to create their own niche and to start their own careers. And what bigger testimony than to say that in India, we are able to put up a platform where more than 50% participants are women today sitting right Fantastic. here. Fantastic. Big round of applause to the ladies. The women entrepreneurs have showed up at the Global Entrepreneurship Summit. And then let me take this little further to say that it's India that has produced, you know, sports women in fields that get us med medals and, you know, things like wrestling and gymnastics, which were so far, you know, typified as being men's sports. Today, India has women fighter pilots in the Indian Air Force. Today, it's Indian Navy that has started an all-woman circumnavigation around the world, you know, just as an expedition. Today, India has a defense minister who's a lady. Today, India has, you know, senior ministers who are ladies. And there is no country in the world where 40% of the banking sector is headed by women. Lovely. That was a great note, great closing note from a banker, Ivanka. First of all, I appreciate the discussion and, and all the panelists for, um, for just a really great dialogue that happened here today. But I do want to follow up on, on something that, that Karen was talking about as it relates to STEM education particularly. Because when you think about the landscape in the developed world, where there has been better access to capital, certainly, than in the developing world, and, and more progressive policies to, to support working families, in some cases better um, than others. But there has been a stagnation in terms of closing that gender wage gap. And it's really sort of persisted and stayed. It, it closed, 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 and then flatlined over a decade ago, and it stayed that way. And when you really break down the reason for that and what's causing that, it's women traditionally have in fields, and when you look at industry segmentation, you have a lack of participation of women in higher growth fields like STEM fields, in computer science fields. Um, and you also have an unfortunate circumstance where traditionally women do dominated sectors of the economy are undervalued financially and are underpaid financially. So I think both need to be disrupted. We need to get more men into so-called women's fields, and we need to get more women into um, STEM fields where our participation rates are really abysmal. I'm incredibly fearful that when you look out and you think about where the future of work is going, that if women continue to represent only 13% of engineers in the United States or continue to represent only 24% of computer science professionals, that the gender wage gap is actually going to grow 
as opposed to contract in the years to come. So I think this is something we need to address. It's something that this administration in the United States is very, very focused on. Each president has the opportunity to prioritize for the Department of Education what they want them to focus on. And um, the president issued a presidential memorandum just last month instructing the Department of Education to prioritize STEM education. And in the guidance required that gender and racial diversity be considered when granting um, the, the money towards all of the different programs so that the programs are actually designed to encourage gender diversity and to encourage racial diversity and to prioritize computer science. So I think it's critical that we think about occupational challenges and making sure that there's more equitable balance in especially the high growth industries as, as we look forward as um, and as we think generally about the future of work in our own countries and, and around the world. So more men in women's uh, 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 domains and more women in men's domains well. As well. then they wouldn't be sort inclusive, of women's industries. Inclusive yeah. growth, closing down the gender gap. Fantastic thoughts. Sherry, final thoughts uh, before we... Just, just a couple of thoughts from me. One is that we've heard a lot about how empowering women, getting women engaged in the, in the market, how women in development you know, really makes a difference. And it, the truth is, when we look at where the development dollars go across the world, across all these programs, it's a pitifully small amount of that money that actually goes to women. I th it's definitely less than 10%, and it's probably less than 5%. I can't remember the exact figure. So how often do we have to say that it really makes a difference if you invest in women for when we actually put our money where our mouth is and make that happen? That's why, actually, the WeFind 5 scheme is such a, a great scheme and where we need to do more. And my, my final thought is this. Um, it's all about choice and diversity. You know, we're talking about women as though all women were alike and all men are alike. And of course, we're all different. But it's about embracing diversity and most of all, respecting each other's choices, which is why when Ivanka talked about those women who choose to devote themselves to their family and work at home. That's their right and their choice. And actually, as women, we should be kinder to each other about each other's choices and actually help each other so we can make a choice and change our choices throughout our lives. So let's hear it for, for choice and diversity. More power to you. Karen, final thoughts? Any final thoughts? Yeah, my final thought is it's going to take all of us to change the dialogue in men and women. And I would just really encourage all of, everybody here in the audience, it's amazing how many people are here, get involved. Get involved in changing the discussion, changing the trajectory, helping to invest in women entrepreneurs. Women cannot do this alone. We need men in the conversation helping. And the world is a better place when we all come together with a common vision and collaboration and working together. And I think together we can do some amazing things. Fantastic. Like I said right at the beginning, right at the onset, we have, we have a cracker of a panel. Chanda Kocher, Karen Quinto, Sherry Blair, Ivanka Trump. These ladies did not need me here. They only needed me as much as a fish needs a bicycle. But I think they put up with me. Thank you, ladies, for your wonderful, wonderful thoughts. Thank you so much for this lovely opportunity. Thank you very much.